recording available afterwards. And that's your notification, it's being recorded. Um, so please use the Q&A box for questions. Dr. Bizu Galaye will be um, fielding questions for us and giving them to the speakers. Um, and today's slides and references will be available. Um, we do have a Google Drive and Shaylee, whose email's on the screen, will share the, Zoom, the Google Drive link via the chat feature at the end of this or towards the end of the presentation. And all the resources are in the Google Drive are public access and um, you have permission to use them as helpful, including altering them if you need them for your own work. Um, so I will um, leave it now to our speakers, who are um, Dr. Carmel Choi and um, Christy Dangla, who are at um, Mass General Hospital in the Department of Psychiatry and at um, Harvard School of Public Health in the Department of Epidemiology. Take it away, Carmel. Thank you. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Carmel. I'm here with my colleague, Christy Dankla. Our training is in clinical psychology, and we also conduct research on stress and psychological resilience. I have a particular focus on protective factors for depression and PTSD, uh, like physical activity and social support. And Christy has a particular focus on coping with grief, loss, and bereavement. So we're really grateful to the Harvard Chan School of Public Health um, for the chance to just share some of the helpful things that we've learned over the years about stress and resilience and to discuss some of these best practices for coping during very uncertain times like this. As a quick roadmap, this is just what we'll cover today. Stress, understanding what it is and how to recognize it. Resilience, what it is, what it means and why it's possible. Coping, what is coping, what it's not, and how to cope flexibly. And then also some specific coping strategies that go along with that. And then we'll end with a time of discussion where we're really excited to hear more um, about the questions and perspectives that everyone has. And just a quick note that this session isn't meant to replace clinical advice, and we do recommend seeking professional support if you do have any specific concerns. So according to psychologists, there are a couple universal ingredients that can make something stressful to us. And these include novelty, something new you haven't seen or experienced before, threat, something that could actually be harmful or negative to you in some way, unpredictability, something that you don't exactly know if or when it will happen, and lack of control something that you feel like you have very little to no control over. And each one of these ingredients on its own is enough to make us feel stressed. But with the current coronavirus outbreak worldwide, what we're really seeing is all of these ingredients coming together and happening all at once, like a perfect recipe for stress. For example, the virus is new, there's still a lot we don't understand about how it spreads, how it's contained, and there's that possibility that we or our loved ones could get sick with it or already are. The quarantines and lockdowns mean not being able to leave the home, see people, or do the things that we're used to doing. And with schools and daycares closing, these are critical structures that families and students have been counting on and have left many people scrambling. We're feeling the strain on our jobs and savings, things are selling out in stores, and there's a shortage of medical supplies for our frontline healthcare workers. And meanwhile, we're reading the news about things happening in the country and in the world with not very much control over it all. So with all this going on, it is no wonder that many of us are feeling quite stressed. And if you are feeling stressed, if you're feeling this way, know that you are not alone. A quick Google search of coronavirus and stress brings up many, many articles. And the search for information on this topic only appears to be growing in popularity. So people are recognizing that they are feeling stressed about this and want to do something about it. The first step to doing something about stress is recognizing when we are in fact stressed. So what are some of the key signs of stress? These signs can be divided into emotional signs, like feeling anxious, sad, irritable, frustrated, or even numb. Physical signs like experiencing changes in energy, appetite, whether eating more or eating less, not sleeping very well, moving more slowly than usual, 
cognitive signs like having a harder time thinking or concentrating or remembering things or focusing on things or even spending a lot of time worrying. And behavioral signs, and which might include withdrawing from others, being less productive, getting into arguments, taking risks that you usually don't take, or using substances. So knowing these signs of stress and recognizing if and when they are happening in us can better prepare us for knowing when to use our coping strategies. But let's talk for a quick second about the adaptive nature of stress. So we often have this belief that, oh, stress is bad, we should get rid of it or avoid having it. And this might actually lead us to feel guilty and stressed about being stressed. And so an important thing to remember here is that some stress and anxiety are actually good for us. Our brains were wired to actually pay attention to the things that could be bad for us in order to keep us safe. And our bodies were designed to react in specific ways in fight or flight to help us get out of tough situations, whether we're running away from a lion or trying to avoid illness. So even now, if you are feeling stressed, that is actually our body and brain doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're trying to help and protect us. So here it might be useful to remember Goldilocks principle, where some stress is good to keep us safe and alert and on our toes. Too little stress and we fail to take action to help ourselves. While too much stress can get in the way of good functioning and actually wear us down over time. So it's worth thinking about where you might fall on this spectrum today. And so with some of these principles about stress in mind, I'll now turn over to Christy to talk a little bit about resilience. Thanks, Vermel. So this interest in the adaptive sides of, of, of stress <clears throat> has been sort of core to the understanding or the research in resilience. Let's go to the next. So there are many definitions of resilience that probably uh, many of you have been exposed to, but I would like to present resilience as sort of this conceptual framework. And one of our goals today is to offer some sort of big picture concepts in order to um, put, give some context to all this sort of coping tips and strategies that we're all being inundated with so that we have a sense of, of, um, of where these things fit into a bigger whole. So resilience can be thought of in sort of three buckets. And the first bucket is at the capacity. These are sort of inborn traits. These are sort of things that we can't necessarily change. These can be things um, like hardiness, um, personality traits. We may think of some people that come to mind who seem unflappable in the context of stress. Again, these are things we can't necessarily change. So we won't focus as much on these today. In the middle bin, we have the process. And this is where a lot of um, research in our group has, has focused, is on these sort of long-term um, changes in over time in the context of high stressors or in the context of exposure to trauma, much like what we are facing today. So what we know about this process is that there is a dynamic equilibrium between risk and protection, and that these things unfold over time. And in, in, a, in a complex interaction, with individual level and multiple systems like culture um, and, and even the environment. The third bin on the right of this diagram is as an outcome. And this outcome is again, something we can't necessarily change, but it has been a focus of resilience research to understand after exposure, who, um, what, 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 um, what describes people who seem to have who have managed well after exposure to trauma versus people who seem to have experienced some setbacks. Again, these are things we can't change. So today we'll really be focusing, like I said, on this middle bin, which is resilience as a process. Next. <clears throat> so one thing we learn when we look at resilience as a process is that it is the norm rather than the exception. When we have better data to follow people over time, what we find is that there are some prototypical patterns of how people cope or respond to trauma. And the good news about this research is that what we've learned is the majority of people who experience high stress or trauma do appear to maintain stable levels of functioning. On the right, there is a graph 
<clears throat> of uh, following from deployed soldiers from the Millennium Cohort Study. And what we found here in this particular study was that 83% of these soldiers fell into a category of having stable or low symptoms of PTSD. And a relatively smaller proportion up at the top bar had um, chronic symptoms of PTSD. So these pro the relative proportions in these categories change depending on the stressor and depending on the study and depending on the sample. And in context of very high stressors, such as um, being we found from the SARS study in um, Hong Kong, uh, from a SARS study in Hong Kong, being quarantined and ill from SARS um, was a, a very high stress situation. But what we still find, even in the situations, is that the majority of the of groups do fall into this sort of stable low um, trajectory of, 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 of maintaining functioning and, and low symptoms. Next. So the question has been that um, a lot of our work uh, group has focused on is what are these resilient factors? What is going on for this group that's able to maintain these sort of stable, um, stable functioning, even in the context of high stress? So on the right, we have I have a sort of ladder of, of systems starting from biological system up to the larger natural environment system. And this is just to point out that these resilience factors occur at multiple levels. We have individual levels, but it isn't just the individual level that can be a resilience factor. Communities, social support, political systems, even natural environments, these are all factors that influence the capacity to respond resiliently to stress and trauma. Today, we'll be focusing mostly on the individual factors because um, that's the focus of our talk. We'll be looking at some biological systems that are resilience factors, psychosocial systems, and social environment. When we collapse these three sort of semi-individual level factors, what we find is that there are sort of five primary domains in which resilience factors can fall. And these are factors that relate to significant others, attachment, having social networks, um, the ability to self-regulate is a big one, problem solving, having agency and mastery, and then faith, hope, and meaning making. Today, we'll be talking about a few of these specifically when we get into some, some uh, coping tips. But I think the, the, one of the main points I wanted to make in this diagram was that none of these in and of themselves are concrete or stable factors that are um, resilient. Rather, it's the capacity to flexibly choose and select fact, um, styles and tips that um, achieve a desired end that is really a key predictor of resilience. So that's to say that resilience may not always look like something positive, a, a positive trait. Resilience can encompass um, a variety of approaches to maintaining stable functioning. And it's really the ability to select and choose which factor or which trait or which behavior is most effective in that particular situation that's really a core what's emerging is sort of a core feature of having, of maintaining resilience. So with that, I'll turn it over back to Carmel to talk a bit about some of the specific individual factors. So before we get to specific coping strategies, we just wanted to put coping into context with two broad ideas. The first framing <clears throat> idea is the question, is what would we do if, we treated this as a crisis, this being extraordinary times. When we hear the word crisis, our minds might think about an emergency or a life-threatening situation, but actually psychologists and dictionaries define crisis more broadly as a time of intense difficulty or disruption, a time when usual patterns are breaking down, and a time when important changes are happening. And by that broad definition, this is for many of us indeed a crisis. It is a major disruption of life as we know it. And that's hard. This is a hard and unusual situation. And in a crisis, we don't expect people to jump right into what they normally do, whether it's work, socializing, or even coping effectively. In a crisis, we really shift our expectations to simply getting through the day, getting through moments, 
and getting through and getting by might be as much as we can expect from ourselves and others right now. So it's great if you've picked up a new language or developed your own at-home curriculum in the past week or so, but it's also totally okay if you are just getting by and surviving. In a crisis, one of the most productive things that we do know how to do clinically is to stabilize. If we can stabilize first, then we can figure out how to cope and move forward. And for this, even one predictable thing a day can be very helpful as an anchor point for stability during uncertain times. And these anchors might look like waking up at the same time every day, keeping a daily ritual like coffee in the morning or an afternoon check-in with a loved one, making sure to eat a few times a day, three times a day, or even repeating a favorite music playlist. So no matter what that anchor looks like for you, give yourself permission to prioritize the kind of structure that, find, that you find comforting and lean into these things for as long as it, this whole process feels disruptive for you. So for some people, this might take just a few days and for other people, this can be an ongoing process. The secret is that there is no timeline for this. Be kind to yourself and to others. And remember that what we're going through here is not normal. So we shouldn't be pushing for normalcy or productivity necessarily. I read recently that for those of us who are you know, working from home, we aren't just working at home, but we are working at home during a pandemic. And that is something very different. And so if it feels different, it's because things are different. When we are ready to think about coping, it can be hard to know where to start. We are bombarded with so many tips and suggestions even for this current situation. And so the question is, how do we organize everything? So one helpful approach is a classic framework that's been around for over 30 years now that was initially developed by the psychologist Lazarus and Folkman. And my group at Duke adapted this framework several years ago into a more simple illustration for a coping intervention for traumatic stress. And it goes something like this. So imagine for a second that all of the stress that you are carrying today and this week is contained in this bag. And this looks and feels like one big giant thing to carry. But what makes this bag so heavy are actually all the rocks or specific stressors that are carried inside. And so what can help first is to simply take out all the rocks and just look and name what's there. For example, I am stressed about childcare. I'm stressed about getting sick or my parents getting sick. I might be stressed about losing my job. I'm stressed about how to help, and maybe I'm stressed about the economy, and so on. And looking at each one of these stressors one by one, you can then decide, is this changeable or is this unchangeable? Is, if something about the stressor is changeable, then it makes a lot of sense to apply problem-focused strategies that try to change the situation that is stressful. So if my stressor is the possibility of getting sick or getting other people sick, then a problem-focused strategy might be reading up on the CDC guidelines and taking steps to follow these guidelines as best as I can. Or if my stressor is childcare, that might look like brainstorming with other parents, looking up online resources, making a plan for what each day could look like. A minor stressor that I had this week was not having a private space for working at home. And as you can see, problem-focused strategies can take all shapes and sizes, coming at you live from my home office. And on the other hand, if the stressor is unchangeable for now, if I can't really do much to sort of shift what's going on, then it makes more sense to apply emotion-focused strategies that take care of how I feel, even if I can't change anything about the situation. So if I'm feeling really stressed about the economy at large or the health of my parents or grandparents across the country, and I've already done all I can for them, 
then an emotion focused strategy might look like accepting that this is going to be tough, not having much control over it, or talking to someone about how I feel. And Christy will talk more about some of these, these specific strategies. But here, the main idea is really to take a look um, and identify what is most stressful right now. To ask ourselves what is changeable or not changeable. And then to choose coping strategies flexibly based on that. And so this does two things. The first thing is that uh, going through this process engages our thinking mind at a time when the emotion part of our brain might be really, really activated. And there's good research to su support that this kind of shift actually helps us to regulate our emotions more effectively, tuning into the thinking part of our brain. And the second thing is that going through this process gives us flexibility in how we cope. So instead of just having one go-to strategy or only doing one thing, we know that we can have choices and that we can change and adapt based on the situation. And this flexibility, as we mentioned, is quite important for resilience. So if this framework speaks to you, it's something that you can go through and use anytime that you're feeling stressed. And we will also share a copy of this diagram in the Google Drive um, of resources um, so that you can use it. So with these coping principles in mind, uh, let's now turn to some specific strategies. <clears throat> Our idea was to, we can go to the next slide. Our idea here was to present this sort of framework so that we had a sort of a meta structure to think about the specific skills we're using and, and, and to kind of build this flexibility muscle a bit. So these are some um, ideas for some emotion focused coping. And again, like Carmel said, these are things that we can do to feel better despite the ongoing problem. So this is when we've assessed the stressor, we've realized there's actually, it's completely out of our control. There's nothing we can do about it now. We cannot change external environment, but what we might be able to do is change how we feel about it. And this can be a very powerful, um, this can be a very powerful choice and intervention. And there are many strategies to achieve this sort of um, internal self-regulation, which we know is a resilience factor. Some things that um, I, these are, these are some of my go-tos. Um, these are some that I've also identified that might be particularly useful now. Uh, mindfulness practice. There's so many resources online um, for mindfulness. There are amazing apps for um, leading and practicing mindfulness. These are strategies that are not going to change. Again, they're not problem solvers. They're not going to erase the anxiety. They're not going to dramatically alter the circumstances, but they will be things that can be done in the moment to change an internal state. So mindfulness practice, a breathing practice, and today we'll walk through um, one specific. Um, humor, one of my favorites, um, titrating media exposure, um, choosing fun activities, exercise, um, a big one. Uh, which is also challenging given that now as mobility is being more and more restricted, it becomes very challenging to do um, outdoor exercise. There are, again, we, we have fortunately access to so many online resources and there are great videos and um, there are um, also yoga classes are being live streamed and many of them are free. Um, so this is a way, these are alternative strategies to engage in some sort of physical activity distraction, prayer, journaling, writing, or drawing. Again, just to emphasize, these are things that are not going to be complete fixes and they're not going to choose the ex uh, change the external situation. They will change our internal state. Let's go to the next one. Next slide. <clears throat> so today, what I thought we might do all together is practice actually one of these skills together, which is belly or diaphragmatic breathing. Um, diaphragmatic breathing is a very powerful intervention because it recruits so many aspects of our phys physiology in a coordinated motion that can, when done deeply, soothe and calm the nervous system. It's also very accessible. It can be done anytime, anywhere. Um, I have been doing it um, on this talk just to sort of help soothe and relax a little bit. 
it always works. Um, it's always accessible to us. We take about 23,000 breaths a day and we always have access to our breath. It can be done also in short snips. This doesn't have to be done um, um, extensively. It can be done even three quick deep breaths or long deep breaths can be an effective intervention and start to um, um, enhance a relaxation response. So let's go to the next slide. So as a quick frame, one of the reasons this is so effective is that it intervenes uh, directly in our parasympathetic nervous, our, our, our nervous system response. We have two sort of extremes in our sympathetic, in our nervous system. On the top, we have our fight or flight system. We've probably heard about this. This is a parasympathetic nervous system that are coordinated actions that prepare us to fight or flight when there is a, uh, an immediate danger. This is a very adaptive system. It's when we've needed and when we've relied on for um, our entire length of our evolution of our species. But sometimes this constant activation can cause a chronic stress, which then can become dysfunctional and and um, unhealthy. So the the alternative, the opposite system is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is sort of this rest and digest system, which then and throughout our day we modulate between these two. So through breathing, we can actively intervene on this activation to start to dampen some of this um, nervous system response. Let's go to the next slide. So what I'd like to do for the next minute or so is I invite everyone to participate in an actual belly or diaphragmatic breathing exercise. This will take about a minute. One of the reasons we wanted to actually do this today is because experiencing this firsthand can actually be a very powerful teaching tool rather than just hearing it described. It's not a, maybe um, many of you on the call here today already have a breath practice um, or have done this already. So this may be familiar to you. If it isn't familiar to you, then I invite you to sort of join us to experience this firsthand. So there are about six steps involved in this. And the first step is to sit in a comfortable position. And um, I like to place a hand on my chest and on my abdomen just so I can get some feedback on what my body is doing. So <clears throat> as, um, as, an, as an illustration of what we're going for here, the goal is to deepen our breathing so that our belly rises and falls. This is something that we do naturally and we are all born with this capacity. And if you look at babies or sleeping children, you'll notice that their, their belly is rising and falling as they breathe. As we're exposed to chronic stress and get older, our breathing starts to get more shallow on a chronic, on a long-term basis and sits more in the chest. So our goal with this exercise is to bring our belly, our breathing back down into our belly so that that rises and falls. To experience what this is like, if you lean forward actually in your chair, lean forward, you will find that this position forces the belly to actually rise and fall with your breath. So that is the kind of thing that we're going for here when we practice this. <laughs> so in the second step, return sort of to your position. Um, if you feel comfortable closing your eyes, you can do that, or you can just let your gaze um, settle gently on some fixed point. And Start by just turning your attention inward and doing a quick body scan. Just notice how you feel. Start from your head and work down through your trunk, your legs to your feet. And this is also a bit of mindfulness practice. So just acknowledging and noticing how you feel, not focusing on the thought, just observing it and letting it go. And then we'll start by taking one deep breath on the inhalation through the nose and internally count to five as you do that. Feel your lungs expand and your belly rise and then let that breath go either through your nose or your mouth. Take a normal breath and return to that cycle Deep breath in to the count of five. 
and then gently exhale. Repeat this cycle five times now on your own. And now with that last breath, before we stop, take another scan, another body scan. Start with the head and move down through your body. And just notice or observe any differences. You may not feel any differences and that's fine. You may have <clears throat> unwanted thoughts and that's fine. You can just notice them and let them go but just take this chance to just observe. And then when you're done, you can return to the normal breathing. So um, this activity is again, an emotion focused coping strategy. This is something that you can use anytime, anywhere in less than even three breaths can be effective in activating that parasympathetic nervous response and inducing this relaxation. So uh, these are, this is an effective strategy to use when, um, when you cannot change the external circumstances. It would not be an effective strategy to use if there was a snake chasing you. But if, if, if you cannot change the external circumstances, then this is one that is um, nice to have in your back pocket and use at any time. Let's go to the next slide. So for the next part, we'll turn to the other sort of arm of the all of this two-pronged approach to um, categorizing coping options. And problem-focused coping is, a, is something that you can do to take steps to solve or address the problem. These work best when you can control the source of stress, such as exams or work demands. And some of the ideas and some of the things that I um, have noticed to be helpful in my own life are setting achievable goals, making a reasonable schedule, reaching out to friends online, focusing on what we can change. And we can stock up on supplies if that's possible. Educating ourselves, having good information. Um, studies have shown that's a, that's a strong protective effect, especially in situations like the pandemic we're facing. Practicing good sleeping habits. Um, and a second, the last two that I, I have found especially powerful in these circumstances of the COVID-19 outbreak is volunteering or finding a way to serve. My neighborhood listserv in Somerville has a um, has people writing in, offering to shop for neighbors, um, sharing poetry, sharing stories, sharing inspiration, and it's really been, um, I think, a source of strength for for others, and also a source of support for those receiving those messages. Um, getting together with our group to prepare for these sort of forums and these presentations has also. I've noticed been very protective and had a very strong, like sort of um, <clears throat> um, protective effect for me and lifted my mood, given me inspiration, helped me feel better. So serving and um, volunteering can be a really effective problem focused coping strategy. Let's go to the next slide. So just to summarize, before we turn it over to discussion and questions, the key point here is that flexibility in selecting a coping strategy is really the key. There's so many tips out there. I know everyone on this call has a whole suitcase full of coping skills that they found effective in the past. As Carmel said, this is a novel um, circumstance that we're in and this is new. I have been thinking a lot about lately about sort of this resilience niche idea where some of us might find we are very resilient in sort of situations that are stressful that we've been used to, such as um, in academics, um, you know, giving talks or presenting our work or handling grants or deadlines. But when we're thrown into a novel situation, we may not have the muscle to really exercise the coping skills in that, in that new demand situation. So trying new things is gonna be good. Um, knowing that there are gonna be ups and downs in this and that we can 
intervene. None of these things are going to be perfect solutions, but they will help us sort of slide down this up and down. And this process of identifying the stressor, going to a suitcase and pulling out things that might be effective, evaluating the effect, it did this work or did this not? Should I maintain the strategy or should I change it? These are sort of like um, the structure that we can hang all of these individual coping tips on to, to help us um, contextualize all these disparate pieces of information that we're getting. And um, finally, just to close on this idea that there is no one perfect way to handle all of this. Um, George Bonanno has coined the term coping ugly, and that suggests just to, just to convey this idea that resilience is not always a um, comprised of, of having extraordinarily superhuman capacities or being um, making positive choices um, all the time. Sometimes it can be messy and sometimes it can be difficult, but I think the point is, is that we are flexible and that we respond to the feedback from our environment on how successful or unsuccessful that particular choice was. <clears throat> so with that, we can um, open it up to questions, thoughts, um, to the forum. Thanks, Christy and, and Carmel. Um, folks, if you have questions, could you please type them using the Q&A box? Well, while people are typing their questions, um, well, there's one question. Uh, do you have any tips to helping loved ones coping from a distance? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, at a time when we can't sort of physically join up with our loved ones, fly to see them or, you know, drive. Um, that is a, a common concern that a lot of people have is, you know, worrying about the safety and the health um, and well-being of their loved ones. Um, along those lines of sort of thinking both from a problem-focused way and an emotion-focused way, there are ways that people are coming up with creatively now to sort of reach out and connect to their loved ones and sort of check in with them on a daily basis. We might be doing that even more than we have been doing before, um, you know, whether texting or calling um, and sort of seeing how people are doing. Um, to some extent, um, there are ways that we can sort of continue to connect and, um, you know, share information that we find helpful, um, advice, strategies, and everything like that. Um, and at some level, there is a sense of not being able to do as much as we might like to do for our loved ones. And so that's maybe where the emotion focus stuff comes in as well. Um, really accepting that while we can do everything we, we can, there are some things we can't do from a distance um, and how to cope with that as well. Christy, any yeah, just a, yeah, just, it's, it's a great question. I think something probably on everyone's mind. Um, especially as the stressors are likely to increase over the, the coming weeks. Um, one thing that's been really fascinating to me that, that I've noticed is I've connected with so many people in my life that I wouldn't have normally connected with before. And sometimes having just um, sort of concrete, like I've uh, connected with an uncle in Italy. And so we've been exchanging um, recipes and we exchange uh, pictures of our dinner with each other. This is just a small thing, it's a concrete thing, it's also a bit of distraction, so it's um, a pleasant thing. So it sort of touches on many of the, of the coping strategies we've talked today all in one, but having, um, having uh, concrete um, <clears throat> or pleasurable things to ch exchange with, the, with our loved ones, and we do have the capacity to do that with, hopefully our loved ones are connected with um, a phone or a, um, video chat or WhatsApp or some of the ways that we can communicate. I think this is the challenge of um, connecting with maybe elderly loved ones who may not have this technology. Um, and that's another, uh, that's another important thing that they be connected with this so that they can um, stay in touch with, with family. Um, there's another question. I think, you know, this also relates to um, a session uh, we had about a week ago 
do you have any suggestions for helping young children cope with when, when they don't really understand things, uh, why they are different, why also adults are fearful? Yeah, we, we have, I would really refer in, in our shared Google Drive, there's a great talk um, that I, I believe is now recorded with from Archana um, Basu on um, talking to children about um, what's going on in the context of COVID-19. There's some really great tips there. I think one of the takeaways I got from that is that uh, children, when we think about how to um, talk to children about this, or there's a, that, um, we have to consider where they are in the developmental spectrum. Speaking to a three to five year old and their needs are gonna be very different than an adolescent. And so um, I have young children, they're three and five. And one thing that I've noticed is that they seem very happy during the day and they don't necessarily identify any particular stress or concern but it comes out in their behaviors. So um, they're uh, particularly clingy. Um, they uh, are very resistant to being separated from, from us. Um, and um, they have interrupted sleep at night um, and uh, some more nightmares. So to me, these are signals for, for parents to interpret. As there is stress going on, there is a need to be able to speak directly to communicate with children about what is happening so that they can know that they're going to be safe and taken care of. And um, for those of us on the call who have older children, maybe they can speak to some specific strategies because those are going to be very different than what we might do for younger children. Well, on uh, sort of on the other spectrum, there's another question, which is how do you maintain healthy dynamics at home with college aged kids? I wonder if you have any tips. Yeah, great question. Um, no personal experience in that regard, but um, I think that knowing that this is going to be an adjustment for all um, and sort of expecting it to be kind of a time of reconfiguring dynamics, you know, college students come, coming home, um, living at home for, you know, the foreseeable future. Um, I think that that will necessitate a lot of uh, communication up front about you know what to what to expect what roles might be needed at home um, for everyone and just expect that it will be sort of an ongoing process as as opposed to expecting that it will be easy um, I'm wondering if you know other people have suggestions or even um, some of our participants who are going through this um, if they might have any thoughts on that Well, um, there's one suggestion, I guess this is for an earlier um, question from Dr. Corte, one of our colleagues saying ways to cope from a distance. She's found it helpful sending her mom weekly cards, even though she speaks with her on a daily basis. The additional of getting something in the mail each week has been really helpful. Mm. That's a lovely idea. And I think it just highlights that there are so many ways to reach out during this time. There's another suggestion um, from a participant uh, saying, you know, there's a, she loves the CNN 10 news for adolescents. My daughter has been following that as well. So it's very age appropriate news with balanced positive news. Um, we also compartmentalized when and how much to talk about COVID-19 and spend the rest of the day on usual routines with increased moments of playing and having joy. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so another question is, you know, related to uh, what you had uh, presented, Christy. Can you speak the value of emotion freedom technique or, or is that an intersection, I guess, between problem focused and emotion focused strategies? I did, I did see that question and I thought that's like a, a brilliant question. I, I um, am not, <clears throat> familiar with a particular model that has sought to integrate these two um, types of coping, but it, it certainly is one could imagine that there would be an intersection between those two. And um, it's, you know, I think that, Carmel, you can also um, speak to this if you if you have ideas, but I, I think the, um, the, the idea of these two, the, the two things in, in, in truth aren't that separable. Um, they are overlapping, 
this is this is um, they are responsive to the context and I think that's one of the big things is that our evaluation of what is going on in the environment changes and sometimes it can our stress process themselves can interfere in our interpretation of our environmental cues um, like for example um, high stress can sort of narrow our ability to integrate disparate pieces of information um, it reduces our information processing capacities so when we're calmer, we may reevaluate the source of the stressor and find that um, that other strategies might be also effective where we can process more information. So I think there's certainly a feedback between these two um, approaches and they certainly um, modulate each other. Mm -hmm. I would totally agree with that, Christy. And um, the, the interplay between the two and recognizing that one stressor can have changeable and unchangeable components for which we can apply sort of, you know, more soothing strategies to just try to um, comfort or calm ourselves and while equipping us to then take action. Um, sometimes this can sort of follow a sequential, like uh, one after the other uh, steps where um, the, maybe the first thing that we need to do is sort of cooling down our brain. Um, there's talk about sort of a cool mode and a hot mode of emotion. And, you know, when we're in the cool mode, we can sort of think more logically about what to do and how to take action. But sometimes we're not ready to sort of access that part of our, our coping and our brain. So um, sometimes it does require first focusing on our emotions, really acknowledging them um, and um, engaging in some of these strategies to sort of um, manage those emotions before we're ready to sort of think about problem solving. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Carmela and Christy. Um, there's another question, which is, um, have you found that coping mechanisms for short-term crisis are different than those for long-term or prolonged crisis? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's part of what we were trying to highlight with the sort of thinking about this, you know, like first as a crisis and sort of then what would we do sort of over the longer term. And unfortunately, there is a lot of uncertainty about sort of how long this situation might go on for. And that in itself is really anxiety provoking and stressful for people. Um, but I think that, um, you know, in more acute sort of crisis moments or when, you know, distress is really high, that's sort of the time to sort of use a lot more sort of immediate grounding and um, self-soothing um, and just sort of like doing what you need to do to get through um, a moment in a day. Um, and then um, I think that when we're th thinking more of a long-term coping game plan, um, that might shift to sort of including more um, like making, making more long-term plans and um, strategy, to engaging in those strategies. Thanks. Yeah, Totally agree. And I think one of the things about the particular this COVID-19 situation, it's very difficult to estimate even in, in for myself, the, the length of this crisis, how long will this go on? And having a sense of the time limit is a really helpful frame to selecting a coping strategy. And that could be just practical things like um, stocking up on medication. Should it be for, and, and this recruits sort of a problem solving, um, that the problem focused coping strategies, when we know it's a long-term stressor, we can rely on some of those um, long-term problem focused coping strategies. Um, like Carmel said, in the short-term acute stressor, it was often um, the, the, we're flooded with emotional activation. And so managing, relying more on those emotion focused strategies when there's an acute crisis can help um, is necessary to sort of um, de-escalate an activated system. <clears throat> Thanks, Christy. There's another tip uh, from a participant about dealing with um, long distance. She's found it helpful that her family lives in three different states and they have weekly Zoom calls so that they could see each other, talk with each other, and try to share a virtual meal. And I found it um, helpful personally myself as well that my kids have cousins in Washington State and they try to do virtual calls and, and try to um, have some um, play dates virtually as well. Um, this is another question, um, which is, do you have any strategies that you recommend for folks who have difficulty employing the coping strategies that you shared? even if they are as simple as, you know, making coffee, getting out of bed, 
and others. Um, yeah, we had some, um, we've had some questions on, on this from previous forums on, on, on sort of what to do. Am I fine? Okay. So th this is, it's an excellent question. And I, I think that, um, there's, I would imagine that there's a universal experience of, of we are all struggling with um, using positive or adaptive coping versus um, falling back on some of our old strategies that, that maybe feel good in the moment but aren't um, you know don't don't um, don't have you know good outcomes and I, I think the, the the main message for this is to be gentle with ourselves to be patient to be kind to give ourselves permission to fall apart sometimes to give ourselves permission to vent or to um, be a bit messy, but knowing that we have the skills and the resources are out there to um, to engage in, in in some of the things that are also adaptive that we also have on board. Um, last uh, time Kirsten had mentioned that, and I've also noticed is there are um, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, meetings are now going live virtual. So there are day by day increasing resources out there for um, sources of support um, to, to, to rely on. But to be kind to ourselves and to be patient and to give ourselves permission to um, not always be perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's okay not to be coping all the time. And I think what Chrissy mentioned mm -hmm. at the end um, from George Bonanno about, you know, coping up sort of like whatever, you know, needs, needs to happen. We know that stressful and uncertain times can make us feel very comfortable and anxious and it's very easy and natural to to disconnect or numb out um, by any means possible and to some extent it is okay to to disconnect and try to do whatever to feel better um, and as long as it doesn't become the, the only thing. So sort of you know giving yourself permission to have those moments and then you know whenever you're ready engaging in some of, you know, turning to some of these, um, these options that are available to you. Thanks, Christine and Carmel. Um, I think this also is, is related to the background information that you've shared, Christy. Um, so there's a question that I've heard about stress weakening the immune system and making people susceptible to disease. To what extent is this true? Yeah, I saw that question too. It's a great question. I I I am not a physician, um, <clears throat> but there there is research suggesting that stress does weaken. Um, generally, can have adverse um, health effects, especially long term chronic stress. Whether in this particular context, um, stress is increasing susceptibility to coronavirus, I don't know the answer to that. Um, if we if we take what we know generally that um, you know um, maintaining uh, having having low stress and um, stability and all the things that we actually don't have right now are <laughs> are generally protective. One we we could um, we could extrapolate that um, increased stress could weaken um, immune response, but we I don't know if we know the answer to that question yet. Mm -hmm. Is what yeah. I would say. Yeah, I think there's a um, a lot we don't know about that currently. Um, I would sort of go back to that um, graph we showed about uh, stress and how you know actually some levels of stress are good for us, um, and so you know we shouldn't necessarily view stress as dangerous or sort of compromising us um, necessarily, even though you know there's um, sort of ongoing research into that. Um, but allowing ourselves to have you know, a healthy amount of stress and just watching as we sort of move into higher levels of stress and how that's affecting us and just really being mindful about that too. Thanks, Christy and Carmel. Um, one of our um, clinical colleagues um, has provided also another tip for the earlier question. If difficulty with coping, such as making coffee or getting out of bed continues for two weeks, this would be a time to seek um, uh, psychological help as an option especially since a lot of providers are now providing telehealth options. Absolutely. Um, so the next question, I think, Christy, you're about to answer this. Do you have any tips for managing conflict in home during this time? 
Yes, I appreciated that uh, question. I, I, because I think um, I, I would imagine there are conflicts in every home now. We are all thrown together in a house. Um, we cannot get out. <laughs> we can't see other friends. They're just sort of recipes that just sort of increase, increase stress. So a part of my uh, desire to answer this was to normalize, um, nor normalize this. You guys, I want it. <laughs> I'm Speaking the BBC of. operator. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I saw someone wrote a comment and uh, they found it helpful to apologize. <laughs> That's been a big one we've been relying on. We haven't talked about much, but repair is sort of a core, um, a core uh, clinical intervention to think about ways to repair and, um, and, and say we're sorry and make up for things. We are all under stress when we're it's stressed out, we're not at our best. Um, I think that also stress can, one thing I've reflected on as a clinical person with background in trauma is that the current stressful environment can activate prior experiences of high exposure to stress. So what we might find in ourselves or our loved ones is that we are being sort of flooded with um, prior stressful memories and that can um, distort our behavior. So again, to return to this idea of being kind and being patient with ourselves, giving each other a bit of breathing room, don't take it personally, um, all these sort of like um, common tips. But just to give ourselves this background education that stress does activate prior experiences of stress and prior memories and our um, uh, reactions in the moment that aren't always very productive. Thanks, thanks, Christy. Um, maybe I could pose this question to you, Carmel. Is, do you know if resilience capacity is linked to IQ or emotional sensibility? So, yeah. Oftentimes, IQ and sort of different, you know, emotional intelligence or sensitivity, um, those are considered to be sort of components or factors that contribute to resilient capacity. So if we go back to that um, sort of three component model that we showed earlier, um, sort of that's kind of upstream of like, you know, any stress happening, um, that there there are factors that some people might have higher levels on. So um, that serve as a, an extra buffer or a reserve when stressful things happen. Um, and that might look like being able to sort of, when stress happens to sort of access maybe different skills or um, resources or coping skills um, that have been learned before. Um, and so those can um, sort of contribute to the capacity to be resilient in the given moment. Um, but we also know that there are a lot of factors that are modifiable and a lot of skills and resources that are available to everyone that make resilience possible. Um, so it's not sort of like you're either born with it or not. It's not a fixed trait. Thanks, Carmel. Um, I'm mindful of the time, but maybe one last question. Do you have any tips about you know how to deal with sleep? Um, this could be related with um, people who are essential workers or could, uh, people at the front line um, working day, day to day uh, with COVID-19. Do you have any suggested tips? Mm -hmm. This is a, an incredibly important question and we've been hearing that a lot and sleep is being disrupted a ton these days, uh, both among healthcare workers, but also just among all of us who had our, our daily rhythms sort of um, you know, disrupted. Um, in terms of sleeping tips, uh, there are different buckets that those can fall into. Some include sort of ways to sort of calm down and get ready for bed and do things that are relaxing, including doing some of the breathing techniques um, that Christy mentioned for really engaging the parasympathetic nervous system, slowing us down to rest and digest um, right before we go to bed. There are also a number of sort of very universal sleep hygiene tips that you can sort of Google online and find a list of um, that involve, um, you know, making sure that you're not using a lot of screens before you go to bed, um, you know, not allowing yourself to toss and turn for hours in bed, but instead, if you are going to get up in the middle of the night, going um, somewhere else and coming back to bed when you're ready to sleep so that your bed is a place that feels restful to you. Um, making sure you're thinking about, you know, the light that comes in through the windows and the sounds, um, whether a white noise machine is helpful, sort of all of these sleep factors um, 
can be helpful, but knowing that sleep will be disrupted and that we need to engage in a lot of these strategies. Um, Kirsten and Christy, we talked a lot about this, so <laughs> feel free to chime in on other strategies. Yeah, just quickly, the, the, there are tips on our stress um, handout that's in the Google Drive. Uh, we prepared some bullet points on good, having good sleep hygiene, but I'll turn it over to Kirsten. Yeah, well, thank you, everyone. Thanks, um, Bizu, Carmel, and Christy. Um, I'm thinking maybe we should have one of these on sleep uh, because we get so many questions on sleep, although um, we all like, yeah, so that might be something we um, think about. Um, and thank you for everyone for jo who joined in all of your questions, and we're sorry we couldn't get to all of them. We will be having another session next week, uh, 11 a.m., so same time, and we will um, send out information on that. So thank you very much. Um, uh, Shaylee um, has access to the Google Drive and can send the link. We also did put it, I did send it to some people and we um, put it on the chat. So thank you so much and um, have a good day, everyone. Take care. Bye.